Pero dah. Good stuff. Hey, welcome to Livingstone Church. We're glad you're here on this Independence Day weekend. We're going to celebrate not only our God, but the freedom that we have in this wonderful nation. Before we do that, I'd like to make a little announcement. We're making a big change here at Livingstone Church. We bought some more of these. Because those are very hard. So, the deal is... We have about 25 of these, I think, and so they're going to be first come, first serve, unless you would like to buy one. If you buy, they're eight bucks, which is what it costs to us. And if you buy one, we'll put your name on it, <laughs> all right? And then you can take it home, you can put it in your car, and you can bring it back. We're not going to store it for you because storage here is at a, a minimum. So, if you have one next to you, go ahead and pick it up, but from now on, First come, first serve. Okay, got it? Good job. All right, let's worship. So, you know, when I was growing up in the Baptist church, there were, there were people's seats and their names weren't on them, but you knew not to sit there or you were going to be hurt or shamed. Glad you're here this morning. We're going to worship together. This song is called Stand in Your Love.
for me as a, as a musician and as a keyboardist, really the biggest struggle that I face on a week-to-week -week basis is this dang keyboard pedal. I've spent the last 30 years chasing this thing around the stage, and it's never in the right place. It's extremely distracting. Um, and I just wanted you all to know that. I hope you can take that lesson and apply it to your life somehow. I hope that meant something to you. We serve a great God. We love gathering here on Sundays to worship Him. I love history so much. I am such a huge nerd. So this day for me is like Christmas um, because it brings together, you know, so much history, but also, you know, so much about our faith and, and all that, all that's gone on before we got here to make sure we could actually gather here today and worship. It's just such an awesome day. And we serve a great God who has put us in the greatest nation in this world and just a place where we don't have to. You know, I was in China once. I've been several times, and we had to sign into church. We had to, we had to be approved to enter the church. And we could only do that because we were Americans, right? That, that's the only reason we even got to go in the building. It's just crazy what others have to face. We're so blessed, y'all. I didn't plan to say, am I going to get in trouble for saying all this stuff? I'm not supposed to be talking this much. The joke is, if I talk too much, then he gets to sing. So, <laughs> so. We serve a great God, and this is a great day. Let's sing this together, y'all.
Yeah, I've, um, we want to do one more song. Uh, so in the New Testament of the Scriptures, one of the Apostle Paul's letters, this one is to the church in Ephesus. And in the second chapter, he says, it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. Uh, and it's not of yourselves. Um, it's not by works, lest any of us should boast, right? It's not by anything we do. Grace is an amazing gift. Um, you know, somebody once said uh, it's an acronym, God's riches at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C-E. Everything that he wants for us, everything that he has for us has been purchased by the blood of Christ when Christ, for us, his death, burial, burial and resurrection made us right with God and, and opened up to us a world of riches. So I like that acronym, God's riches. At Christ's expense, that, that is grace. We don't deserve it, couldn't earn it, even if we did deserve it. It, we, it doesn't mean we'd get it. He just freely gives it, right? So, yeah, so it is amazing. And this is an old favorite, and I've asked Summer to lead us. Yeah. 
Heavenly Father, thank you again for our freedoms. Thank you for each other. Thank you for the wonderful gift of Jesus Christ. And it's in his holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. That's beautiful. Thank you, Summer. What's that? Good call on the cushions. Yeah, I know I got my. <laughs> you know what my wife lives for through now every day. What? What? No. <laughs> Kevin is like busier than a one armed paper hanger this morning. The poor guy. He's playing drums today and he's trying to work the sound and he's trying to get the video right and all this kind of stuff. So. Good to see you back on drums there, bro. Poor guy, he earned his pay today. So, <laughs> thanks, Kevin. He's still back there trying to figure out what's... Good stuff. Thanks, buddy. You're the man. Okay. What do you say? Yeah. <laughs> All right, enough. Hey, if you got your Bibles, let's go to Philippians chapter... Four, we're going to look at verse 9, and we're going to talk about the peril of independence today. All right, Philippians 4, verse 9, and let's open up in a word of prayer. Our Father, we are again gathering here together with your people, um, Father, in the midst of, uh, in the midst of turmoil and, and uh, problems in the world that are things the likes of which we have not seen before. Father, not only in the division that is in our country, but also a sickness that seems to be spreading like wildfire across our country. So, Father, we come here to worship a God who does not change, who sits on his throne in absolute sovereignty. Father, we know that all of this is taking place under your watch, under your purview, and none of it is outside of your will. Father, we thank you for the confidence that gives us that we are people who can trust in you no matter how tumultuous the times are. And so in our pursuit of you, we open up this book and, and we ask that you would reveal yourself to us, that we would walk away today with a clear understanding of the God who created us, loved us, and gave himself for us. Be with our time this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. So the past month or, past month or so, we have been witnessing a bit of a, uh, a kind of a social experiment that went on in Seattle. And if you're watching the news and you're paying attention to this, something really unusual has happened. A group of young folks had decided to take over an area of downtown Seattle, about six blocks. And the goal was to create a utopia. A life that is free of the rules and limitations of society. And so they're going to create their own little world. They called it an autonomous zone, which is interesting because their intent was to secede from the United States and create their own little world that was independent. 
of what was happening in our country. And so their thinking was, well, if we can eliminate the police, we can eliminate the, the, uh, the authority that, that people are imposing upon us, then we can live this wonderful and free life. And it wasn't until a few murders later and some several uh, cases of rape that they realized, yeah, it's not working out too well. You know, we need law and order. We need food. We need services. And so finally, after a few short weeks, this experiment spiraled into absolute chaos. And the city took over. What happened in Seattle really is a metaphor for life, if you think about it. Because sometimes, you know, even as Christians, we think that utopia, that real life is, is found in independence from God. And so sometimes what we do is we create our own autonomous zone. I want to be free from the restrictions that God has placed upon me. I want to be free from the laws and the precepts and, and the will of God. You see, I want to live a life that is free of those restrictions. <laughs> and then it doesn't take long, does it, until your life begins to spiral out of control and you experience the corruption and the decay in life that comes when you separate yourself from God. In Philippians chapter 4, we have been studying the things that influence life. What are the things that make an impact upon us individually as believers in Jesus Christ? And remember in verse 8 that Paul lays out that, that one of the most important things that we can do as believers is be careful of what enters our brain. Remember in verse 8, he says, listen guys, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, of good repute, excellent and praiseworthy, make sure these are the things that enter your mind. Remember, we likened it to a firewall or a wall that is built around my mind and I am the doorman. And there's only one way to enter and that is through that door over which... I have authority. And so, as an individual, I allow what goes into my brain. And Paul's telling us, only allow that stuff that is true and right and good and praiseworthy. So make sure you're careful of what enters your brain. Because we had, we had, we had discovered that my, my thoughts become who I am. I mean, I live my thoughts. And so we've got to be careful what we allow to enter our minds. Catastrophe and destruction in life begins with a thought. Ruin in life does not come overnight. It's not a blowout. It is a slow leak. And it begins by seeding my brain with things that should not be there. That's where destruction begins. Perhaps it's the man who uh, at his office he sees this young woman and he looks at her and says to himself, hmm, he begins thinking, that woman would make me happy. I mean, she's pretty and she's young and she's really in shape and I deserve to be happy. God, why did you give me the woman you gave me? You should have given me her true and so he begins to process this in his brain and and pretty soon there is this major discontentment that he has with his own wife because he has convinced himself through these thoughts that what he really needs is that un other younger woman and so he thinks to himself well I'll just ask her out for lunch not a big deal not like I'm gonna go to bed with her I mean we're just gonna have lunch innocent and that's how the destruction starts. Or it's the woman, you know, who at work, she sees this guy, and he's paying a lot of attention to her. And she likes that because her husband doesn't pay any attention to her. 
She can't get her husband to stop playing video games. But this guy at work, boy, he just seems really interested in me. He really listens. He seems to care. And whenever I say something, he sits there and he actually thinks about it and he listens to me. And my husband doesn't do that. So maybe I'll ask him out for a cup of coffee after work one day and we can talk. And that's just it, just talk. It's not like I'm going to go to bed with them. I'm just going to talk. And that's where destruction begins. It's in, my, it's in my thinking. Remember, we had studied Romans 8, and Romans 8 says that the mind that is set on the flesh is death. The mind set on the spirit is life and peace. I can avoid destruction in life by taking the first step and not allowing the lies and those thoughts to enter my brain. Put the filter up and don't let it in because that's where it starts. But we also found out that not only are the things that, that enter my brain have a great influence in my life, but we also discovered that the people that I hang around with have an influence in my life. I mean, I kind of become who I hang around. Isn't that true? Look at verse 9 again with me. We'll look, at, look at what Paul says. He writes, <clears throat> he says, The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. One more time. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So Paul's basically saying to the Philippian believers, listen, you're going to have a model. It's going to be me. You, you, you want to become like me. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine saying that to somebody? You ought to be like me. Well, that's exactly what he's saying, isn't he? Listen, the things that you have learned, the things that you have seen, the things that you have received from me, what? Put them into practice. Become like me. Well, that's awfully bold of him to say. But the reality of it is, folks, we are chameleons, are we not? I mean, we adapt to our environment. We become who we hang around. Isn't it true? All of us are that way. And kind of by nature, kind of by design. I think God designed it that way. You know, I was watching the news reports recently, and if you watch the protesters... Like, they're all the same. Isn't that interesting? I mean, they're all very different people from different backgrounds and different geographical areas, but they're, they all look alike. They all are saying the same, th same slogans, and they, they share the same passions. And it's interesting that, you know, nobody taught them how to do that. They just kind of joined this group, and all of a sudden, they all became the same person because we're chameleons. We adapt to our environment. And you probably do the same at work. I mean, you become like the people that you work with. There's a, a certain culture, perhaps, at your work, and, and you adapt. You become that person. When I left college to join the business world, I went from surfer dude to yuppie businessman. <laughs> I had to. I had to make that change. I mean, there, 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 was, there were things that I needed to change. Like, I traded in my 1972 Pinto with surf stickers and surf wrecks for a BMW. Cool. I traded in my flip flops and board shorts for a suit. <laughs> I actually had to buy a suit. Wow. I had to change my vocabulary. I was working for a computer firm, and you know, I can't go into the business world saying to somebody, dude, this computer's like totally gnarly. You should buy this. I'd be so stoked if you bought this computer. You can't say those things in the business world. I had to adapt. I had to become a chameleon. So it's true that the people you hang around, your environment, you, you become that. And that is why the Apostle Paul says to the Philippian church, you know something, guys? If you're going to imitate anybody, imitate me. Because who is he imitating? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
He says, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. The command is, you guys imitate me because who am I imitating? I'm imitating Jesus Christ. So it's really important who I hang around. Look at Hebrews 13. He says this. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, what? Imitate their faith. So in life, by God's design, you and I are to find models in life, people that we want to imitate. 1 Thessalonians 1. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation and with the Holy Spirit. So the question really is, who am I imitating? Who do I look like? Do I look like the world that I live in? Or do I look like Jesus Christ? Who do I choose to imitate? Well, it's who, who you spend time with. It's who you hang around. And that's why it's essential as a believer that I am mindful every day that people make me who I am. Other people infect me. Other people make an impression upon me. And I've got to be very careful as a Christian, although I live in this world, that I'm not supposed to be part of it. And that it would affect me. Chuck Swindoll used an illustration, I think, that illustrates this perfectly. He says, you know, you put a pair of white, clean gloves on, and you play in the mud. What happens? Does the mud become clean? Or do the gloves become dirty? That's the Christian life, isn't it? I've got to be careful. I live in this world, but I don't want to walk around with mud on me all the time. And that's why there's so much emphasis in the scriptures that God has designed us to use other people as a model. Who am I imitating? So it's essential that we keep in mind who we're imitating, but also in our passage this morning, he says, the things that you got from me, the things that you have received, the things that you have learned and seen in me, he then says, Practice these things. Watch. Look again. Look at verse 9. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, gather up all that information, gather up all that influence, and then do what? Practice these things, which is where most progress in the Christian life short circuits. <laughs> we know the Bible verses, don't we? We go to church every Sunday, we go to Bible study, and we hear all that stuff. But the goal is not learning, the goal is life change. But what good is it if I learn all this stuff and it doesn't make an impact upon my life, if it doesn't change the way I live, if I'm not practicing these things? If I say to you, do you know how to surf? And you say to me, of course, I can surf. I've seen Endless Summer. One and two. Sure, I know how to surf. I, you know what? Recently I saw that movie with that girl who got her arm bitten off by the shark. Well, there was great surfing footage in that movie, wasn't there? I saw that. Of course I know how to surf. Well, let me ask you, have you ever been on a surfboard? Ha! No, 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 no. I haven't been to the ocean in 20 years. Are you telling me you know how to surf? Get... No, you don't. That's the Christian life, isn't it? Oh, you know all these Bible verses, and I know all the truths, and I can line up all of these doctrinal positions. I can put them all in a row. But let me tell you, let me ask you something. Has it, has it had any impact on your life? I mean, is there, is there any life change because of, because of this stuff? I had a woman years ago walk into the church and give me her spiritual resume. You ever meet people like that when you first meet them? Right? They just hand you their resume. Let me tell you how spiritual I am. You know, I got saved when I was a when I was a young kid. And I went to Sunday school, and you know, I went did this, did this, and I did that. And man, you know, I, I've been. And so at the end of this, and after she gave me her spiritual, told me how much she reads her Bible. Anybody ever boasts about how much they read their Bible? 
yeah, stay, steer clear of those people, right? So she's telling me, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, wants to impress the pastor. I'm so spiritual. So I asked her, I said, well, great, well, tell me what you've been doing. Like, how do you serve? What has God created you to do? She says, what? I said, you know, I mean, you know, like, what are you doing in the ministry? What, what, what like, how are you serving? What, do you, what did God create you? What did he create you for? And she looked at me like, well, uh, what do you, I don't know. I'm not sure what you're asking. Like, what do you do? You've got all, this, all these years of reading the Bible and all this kind of stuff. And you do nothing? And she says something. Well, I, you know, I substituted teaching for our Sunday school back in the 80s. She goes, you know. I'm like, really? Is that? It, it, you know all that? And it hasn't really at all changed your life? Well, that's exactly why God saved us. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 with me. He says this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. You guys know that, right? You know that passage? You're familiar with that? Good. Do you know verse 10? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Why did he create you? Trust him as your savior, that's great. But then you sit on the bench, everybody else is playing the game. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Right? We're not, we're not saved by works, but we are saved for works. Right? So what good is all this knowledge and all this study and all this Bible study attendance if... I'm completely useless. Because Paul said, listen, everything that you've received from me, this treasure that I've given you, he says to us, you know what? Put it into practice. Make it work in your life. The goal is life change. You know, I, you sit back and you think, okay, like, as a, you know, I spend most of my week studying a passage. Right? And, it's, and, it, and it's true that the teacher always learns more than the one being taught. And if you've ever taught anything, you realize that. So every week I, I get into a passage and I've got to figure out what's the author's intent. And then I have to be able to explain it in a way that is not only understandable but applicational. And I've got to tell you that, that verse 8 that we've been studying the past couple of weeks um, has made a life change in me. And I'm not saying this to boast, but... I, after, after reading verse 8, you know, where he says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is love, purely good repute and praiseworthy, think about these things. So I actually, I sat back and I thought to myself, have I been a good, a good doorman? Uh, you know, do I really filter the stuff that enters my brain? Am, 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 I, am I actively considering the, the, the thoughts that come in that I... And I actually had to say to myself, you're a really terrible doorman. Because I let thoughts into my head. Like, I have a tendency to self-condemn, and I don't know why. I wake up in the morning, and I feel guilty. Just guilty for no reason. And I begin to think about my day. What did I do wrong? And, oh, God, are you fed up with me? And blah, blah, blah. Will you forgive me? I'm trying to think of what. What do I need to confess? And, but I just feel like this condemnation. You ever feel that way? I thought, you don't know. I'm letting those thoughts into my head, and I should not. Those are wrong thoughts. I mean, they're not true. And so I realized, you know what, something? I really have to put that filter in place, and i got to be honest with you. I mean, after years of doing this, I don't know that I really ever have. That I actively thought through what am I allowing into my mind? That I actively considered what I was watching on TV. If you put up that measure, you say to, you say to yourself, okay, so was what I'm watching true and honorable and right and all that? There's nothing to watch. <laughs> nothing. I mean, even the news, it's like, yeah, huh, golly. And I'm not saying that to sound like, oh, I'm so super spiritual. 
But if I'm not doing that, what, what good is verse 8 to me? And I'm not sitting down and really thinking about what are you letting into your mind? What good is even studying it? Because the goal is life change. So easy to understand the scriptures. It's so easy to read it. You can even meditate upon it, but change. James likens it to looking into a mirror and forgetting what you look like. Watch James 1 with me. He says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who <laughs> delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately has forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, law meaning the word of God, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Huh. So he likens people who hear the word or perhaps read the Bible and whatever, go to Bible studies and then nothing happens. You know, it doesn't show in their lives. He's like a person who looks into a mirror and he looks in the mirror, looks at his reflection and walks away and somebody goes, what color hair do you have on? No. What color are your eyes? Huh. Well, didn't you just look in the mirror? Every morning my wife looks into a mirror that's this big, one of those magnified mirror things, you know. And I walk in and she's at the, you know, She's looking at her, this thing shows pores. <laughs> She's looking at every little eyebrow. I look into the mirror and I walk away. My wife goes, did you not see those nose hairs sticking out of your nose? I mean, were you just not looking in the mirror? Well, it's, I think that's what he's saying. How many of you have been on the beach and seen people wear bathing suits they had no business wearing? And what do you think to yourself? Do you not have a mirror at home? The truth? Because if you saw yourself in a mirror, you would not be wearing that. There should be a rule against that kind of stuff. Sometimes you look at our lives and you go, you said you read the Bible, but your life doesn't really look like you are. I mean, it doesn't. And you say you know all this scripture and stuff, but I look at your life and your language really is, gosh, really? I mean, don't you, aren't you supposed to look at the scriptures and the truths and that's supposed to have a, a fact. Like, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to, you're supposed to live differently than, do you see what he's saying? <laughs> the important thing is not so much learning it, it's living it. You know, practice, he says, he uses the word practice, which means to practice, <laughs> right? And what is practice? Practice means it's not perfect. It means you're getting better at it, right? And so the, the, the form that the, that the word practice is in here brings with it a habitual, continuous action. In other words, I think when God brings us to himself, he doesn't expect us to master the Christian life in one fell swoop. Okay, Chris, now you're a Christian. You got it all down, right? You know what Scripture says, so you know, you're going to live your life perfectly in tune with Scripture. Have any of you ever been able to do that? No, it's a practice, right? I mean, I, I try, and, and I, I learn Scripture, and, 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 and what I do is I, I, I put that into practice. But sometimes, you know, I fail. Sometimes I falter. You know, I really want to be able to be disciplined in this area, <clears throat> And then sometimes I just, I just, I, I, I goof. I can't. But it's not a reason to quit because all, you talk to people. Yeah, I tried to live the Christian life, but it was too hard. I couldn't do it. I tried to be good, but you know, well, it's a practice. As God fills my life through his spirit and I, and I live this life consistent with the truths of God's word. Folks, practice implies failure, doesn't it? But progress, Right? 
you ever been on a diet? It's just, is it just like dieting? Right? You go on a diet and you go, oh man, right? I'm going to be so good this week. And then Sunday comes and you go, you know what? I'm going to eat a pepperoni and I don't care. A pepperoni pizza and I don't care. Am I the only one that does that? I'm going to eat the whole stinking pie. But, you know, you don't wake up on Monday morning and go, oh, you know, I blew it. I'm going to quit my diet. No, I mean, you get back. You get back on the wagon because you ate the pie. And then after you ate the pie, you say to yourself, what? Oh, what have I done? And there's, <laughs> there's the guilt. Oh. And you get back, back on the wagon because it's just like your walk with God. You know, as, I am, as I'm walking with God and I experience the blessings of being in his will, You want that. You starve for it. And then when you, when you, when you goof up and you, you exchange God's will for the desires of your flesh and you experience the corruption and the death and the decay and the deterioration of life from doing those things, you go, you know what? It's so much better walking with God. This whole independence from God thing is just killing me. He ends this passage this way. He says, practice these things in verse 9. Now watch what he says. And the God of peace will be with you. You put these things into practice, what happens? His presence and his peace are with you. If I want to know God's presence and his peace in my life, let's back up. What do we do? We take in the truths of God's word, we put them into practice, and God comes alongside of us, and we experience his presence and his peace. The opposite is true as well. If I seek a life independent from God, if I seek a life that is seeking to fill the desires of the flesh, then I experience the opposite. Because God does not walk with me, he does not go with me, when I go places, he tells me not to go. So instead of enjoying his presence and his peace, I enjoy loneliness and turmoil. Watch Romans 8 with me. He says, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is Life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is what? Hostile towards God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So as I walk away from him, if I'm seeking this life of independence from him, understand it's not just that he's not with me, but now there is hostility, and that's what makes your life miserable even as a Christian, because we can do that, can't we? I mean, even as a Christian, I can, I can seek sometimes independence. Perhaps there's an area in my life where, God, I don't, you're not invited. This is a no-God zone in my life, so I'm going to live this little, uh, this little part of my life without your influence. And, and God says, okay, you, you could choose to do that. You're welcome to do that, but understand, Chris, that I am not going with you. You are alone. And Chris, I'm going to allow you to experience the turmoil and the pain and the suffering of living a life independent of me. Because in independence, there is peril. 1 Peter chapter 2. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, watch this, which wage war against the soul. He's talking to Christians here. Abstain from fleshly lusts. In, abstain from indulging your flesh because what does it cause? It causes a war. I think you've, you've experienced that war, haven't you? I mean, I've been there. Because, because when you convince yourself, you know, as a believer in Jesus Christ, there's this one area of my life. This is my little autonomous zone that I enjoy separate from God. And God says, okay, you can do that, but let me tell you something. You are going to have a war inside of you 
the most frustrated, discontented person on the face of the earth is the Christian who practices that autonomous zone, who has one foot in the flesh and one foot in the spirit. And Peter's right. You do that as a Christian, he says, there's going to be a war going on inside of you, and that war's good. It's good. It's good because he doesn't want you to think that, you know, you can get away with it. You can, you can live both and still be happy and content. No, no, you can't. You can't because it's completely opposite of this new creation that God has placed inside of me, this new life. And this new life, he says, listen, crucify the flesh. Don't, don't even be going, abstain from it. Get away from it. You want to know my presence and you want to know my peace? Take the truths of God's word. Put them into practice. And you will know my presence and my peace. And folks, the more you do that, the more that you practice that, how blessed life is. You, know, you think to yourself, well, why would I ever go back to that garbage? Because a life lived under the lordship of Christ, under his authority. What a great life that.